Good morning, good morning. Here we go again. Another lovely day in paradise. Can you see through there that little bonfire? Oh, let me just turn the blinds on. That's everything that's left from yesterday. See the big pile of wood's gone? And just a little bonfire is all that's left. Those of you that have big bonfires will know that you leave them burning overnight and then in the morning you have to go and rake all the little bits of wood around the outside that haven't burnt into the middle then the whole thing catches light again instantly and uh, and then by this evening I'll just be left with a big pile of ash which will blow away and then after a couple of years you won't know that that's uh, we've had a bonfire there you can if you if you repeatedly have bonfires in the same spot obviously then it, you know the ground never repairs itself but if you have like a bonfire in a different spot so the one you had it last time then the ground will heal itself although apparently when you have a big fire, it uh, magnetizes the stones in the ground or something in such a way that a thousand years later they'll be able to use some technology on that spot and say that's where they burnt all their rubbish. God knows what they're doing here, honestly. They're putting in some sort of electricity substation, but I don't know. We're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, look, that's the only house there. There's another house coming up. All the houses are 300 yards apart. I don't understand why they're uh, need for, and there's the big log pile. There's one of the big log piles for our wood burning electricity generator. Ridiculousness. I've said before and I'll say it again, if they took all of those logs and all the ones that are stacked up alongside the side of the Manston runway and just chopped them up and gave them away as firewood they could heat the whole of bloody East Kent for five years just from wood burners but oh no wood burners are bad now aren't they no I've got two of them and I don't, I'll tell you I'm going to carry on using them they're going on the, the cities I mean things are just getting totally out of control and I know you can say that you know, as you get older, you get more reactionary and you're going about youth of today and all this and how things aren't the same as they used to be when you were young. But I don't know why. The present generation are, uh, apparently just doesn't seem to have learned anything. Not, not in school or from uh, their parents and grandparents about the way the world works. I was saying to Mrs. Angry this morning, I think we probably lived through the... Um, the, the absolute peak of uh, consumerism the last 20 30 years where we had a economy that was uh, buzzing and and driven by free money and consumer credit which is the form of free money um, and now we got to a point where London was buzzing and the, the trains were always packed you couldn't you know you used to run to get on a train and then finally you couldn't squeeze in the door and uh, all the shops had everything and there, there were even shops that sold stuff that I'd never ever want and they were they were still you know and then we had this 10 years of 0% interest rates which encouraged misallocation of capital and people set up businesses where they shouldn't have done and it kept businesses that should have failed alive and it uh, drove capital away from good businesses to bad businesses that didn't make a profit but just you know were, were the valuations are based on what people thought they might be worth in the future even though they were making a colossal loss and um, they're going on about Canterbury all these 15 minute cities now 15 minute cities which means that people are living in the city within 15 minutes of everything. So they've got a theatre, a hospital, a supermarket, all within 15 minute walk, presumably. Which is great. I mean, if you live in the city, that's great, isn't it? 
But if you don't live in a city and you but you still like the theatre and you you know your only way to get to the theatre is to drive in because there's no effing buses in the country, right? Don't just make me laugh about getting into Canterbury by bus. You know you have to drive in. They had two park and rides. One of them's shut for two years for some reason. God knows what they're doing. Cleaning it with a toothbrush, I do not know. But there's no park and ride on the uh, western edge of Canterbury. So, you know, you're going you're gonna to drive in, you're going to get raped for parking, and you're going to get raped because you drive a diesel car. So, what will happen is there'll be a dichotomy between the towns and the cities even more than there is at the moment. And it's going to be exacerbated by uh, the, this, you know, these rules, stupid rules coming in about that you'll only, after 2030, which is only seven years away now, you'll only be able to buy an electric car. And you might as well say, well, you know, in, in 10 years' time, people will only be able to stay in the area that they were born, you know? Because there's no way that people are going to drive down to the south of France in an electric car. And there's no way that uh, people are going to, you know, go on holiday to, to Cornwall in an electric car. All these things are based on the high energy density of uh, petrol and diesel. And I unless there's a massive great breakthrough in battery technology which is possible there may be that where you can literally charge your car in five minutes or something or it would have to be something comparable with the time it takes to fill up your tank at the moment which is about i'd say three minutes four minutes if you could recharge your battery and put another say 300 miles on it in about five minutes then we, we might see a continuation of a long distance personal transport but otherwise I just can't see it happening you know I can't see they're building out the the grid at the moment to charge the cars they're there this winter they've actually had rationing where they have asked people with smart meters not to use their uh, their washing machines and tumble dryers uh, during peak hours <clears throat> so there's no you know, the grid is not resilient enough to charge up everybody's electric cars. Even assuming that there were enough chargers. Come yeah, on. Oh, I don't know my own strength. Can't get the handbrake on. Old bloke with a beanie hat walking along, wheeling a, a bright white one of those things that you stand on, what's it called? Bloke invented by the bloke who went off the edge of the cliff on one. Anyway, in Congress, seems like you might have just found it in a garden shed. So, and that's like, let's say, let's say for example, every one of these cars and every one of these lorries gets electrified, right? Then I'd like to tell them how am I going to electrify my tractor. And my tractor is just a small tractor. And it, it was built in the 1980s or something. You know, it's an old tractor. It's no, no way we're going to electrify it. It's going to need to be scrapped. And a new one is going to have to be built out of metal that's been dug out of the ground using carbon based diesel engines. Uh, it, and uh, assuming it's battery power, the lithium's going to be neat to dug up with with machines that are going to be running on diesel. <coughs> and mine's, as I say, mine's just a small tractor. My, you know, the guys around here, they've got massive tractors. I mean, massive tractors. My plane, which I'll come on to later, which is a little plane, right, before you go mad. My plane is stored at a farm where they have proper tractors. And I'm not joking, the weight on the front, because you have to have a weight on the front to counteract the 
whatever you're using on the back, a plough or whatever, you have to have a weight on the front. And the tractor's sort of in the middle of the two weights. And the weight on the front of this tractor is as heavy as my car is now, this car. So, that's how big these tractors are. They are double digit tons. And you're not telling me that when you add in the resistance that they have to overcome when they just drop the plow and start plowing the furrow, that that's going to be done with batteries. That is not going to be done with batteries, okay? Uh, your, if you've got uh, a small tiny, by which I mean tiny god, in a town, you can afford to have a battery powered lawnmower and a battery powered strimmer and even a battery powered chainsaw. But when you've got an acre, two acres, five acres, seven acres, what I've got, you cannot have a battery powered chainsaw. It has to be petrol powered. A battery powered chainsaw would last precisely 10 minutes on my farm and get precisely nothing done. So I've still got a diesel tractor, I've got a, a petrol powered chainsaw and strimmer and brush cutter. My aircraft is, doesn't even use petrol, it has to use something that's even more refined than petrol called Avgas, Aviation Gasoline. There's no way that that's going to run on a battery. So every single aircraft in the country is going to need to be scrapped. I'm not talking about commercial aviation, I'm just talking about anything other than a glider. And even some gliders have got tiny motors. So, there are, there are electric uh, planes, there's uh, one I've seen being trialled uh, in North East London, they've got a, there's a couple that are taking it round and round and round to get a lot of data on uh, uh, how long it can fly for, you know. But in the same way as you have to have some sort of contingency fuel, say half hours worth of fuel, um, you have to have some sort of contingency in the battery uh, when you land. So let's say that's 20% or, or 20 minutes, 20 minutes flying, say, which I personally would say is pretty tight in my opinion. Um, you know, I was just there uh, for other reasons. Dam Damon's Hall, I think it is, they do a and they're, the, they're just talking normally, you know, as aviators do between themselves and saying things like, well, what's the battery charged up at? And the other one says, oh, 85%. And they're like, well, uh, what do you think? Should we take it up or shall we charge it up a bit more? So ideally, they'd like to have it 100%, wouldn't they? But it's probably not 100% because they probably flown it this morning, haven't they? Probably had it out for 45 minutes in the morning and it's and it's still charging up. So, and the problem with charging is that the first bit is easy. That's why, you know, you can, if your battery's flat, if your phone battery's flat, for example, it's actually not bad because you can get it from like 8% or 12% up to 60% pretty quick. But it's that last bit, that 80% to 100% where it's pushing and the phone's pushing back. That's the problem. So they're like, well, it's 85%, right? Bearing in mind, let's say they've got a 15, 20% reserve. So they've got 65, 75% capacity. So they're taking off with two thirds of a tank of electricity, in, in other words. And then <clears throat> that's predicated on reasonable temperatures you know well the thing about a car is everybody knows that electric cars perform less well in the cold and it's the same with electric planes but the, the added disadvantage that electric planes have got 
is that they climb up into the atmosphere. So you have a thing called the adiabatic lapse rate, which is, I forget exactly how much it is, but I mean, it's significant. You can be, you can take off, let's say in uh, five degrees or 10 degrees and be flying along in two degrees. There's a lot of cooling that occurs uh, to a plane. In fact, planes are mostly air cooled. Um, it doesn't make any sense to liquid cool a plane engine any more than it makes sense to air cool a submarine engine. They're air cooled, but obviously being an electric motor, I would imagine it doesn't generate anywhere near the heat that, or need to run at the sort of temperature that a internal combustion engine needs to run at. Internal combustion engine is happiest at just below boiling point, but 90 degrees Celsius, something like that. Um, so it's possible that I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you're in a way with a plane. <clears throat> the engine is your heater because you're sitting right behind it. You know, all the hot air from the engine is trying to get through into the cockpit. It's only the bulkhead, the firewall, that's to, that keeps it out. And the way that you do, you get heated is you take some, you, you duct some heat off the engine into the capacitor compartment. And that's why we have to worry about carbon monoxide poisoning because if the hot air that's coming through from the engine includes some carbon monoxide because the exhaust has, has got a big hole in it, then uh, you'll go to sleep while you're flying. Which is why mo you know almost all planes have got carbon monoxide detectors in them. So, <clears throat> I don't see a future for aviation at the moment in the foreseeable future and let's understand this is why I'm worried because it's the foreseeable future that they're going to ban everything in. it's but it, it's not the foreseeable future that we've got a solution and their attitude is very much well if we ban it someone will find a solution but I think the solution might be no more general aviation which that is in a, in a parlous enough state as it is with all the airfields closing down for housing development but um, you know my plane has got a um, nice I said to the bloke when I bought the plane how, how long can it stay in the air you know how far can it go what's its range what's its endurance and he said the problem is not with the endurance of the plane he said the problem will be the endurance of your bladder because it can stay in the air for theoretically for five, six, six and a half hours. Which means, <clears throat> in theory, I could fly from Kent to Glasgow if I wanted to, which, you know, I wouldn't, you know, in one go. So, You couldn't do that in an electric plane, is my point. And there are there are loads of other things, you know. <clears throat> they're worrying about air quality and particulate matter and these PM 2.5s, etc. And uh, trying to uh, shame people like me who've got wood burning stoves who are managing to stay warm because we've had the foresight to buy a bit of land and, and grow a bit of wood that we can burn to keep ourselves alive. <clears throat> and good people when it's less starts looking out. But, <clears throat> you know, none of these people have been to New Delhi. What I would say to people is like, if you want to see pollution, don't wander around London saying what a great idea it is that they've got an ultra low emission scheme. Go to New Delhi, have a look at their ultra low emission scheme. See how things are really done in the real world. And then come back to the UK and, and say that you want to pile on these costs of compliance onto everybody. So, you know there's this old saying that if I wanted to go there I wouldn't start from here. Well, not only would I not start from here, I wouldn't go there either. <laughs> Oh dear, I've made myself laugh, Edge. You know, I've made myself laugh. 
haven't had a shave this morning. Okay, so I came in from the bonfire last night, went, jumped in the shower and everything, and then, so this morning I don't need a shower, so I haven't bothered with a shower or a shave. I just tried to stick my hair down onto my head with a wet comb, and that's me done for today. Anyway, not much dentistry, but you know, perhaps a few ideas, perhaps a few thoughts about uh, where we're going in terms of uh, society and that all fits in, doesn't it, with business planning. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.